And welcome to another episode of the Dog on a Trucking Co- Podcast. This week, my guest is Erica Williams. She owns Grandview Freight as well as the Classy Climb. Erica is a consultant who helps uh, people start their own businesses as well as an owner of 12 trucks. And she's currently running a trucking company. So, Erica, welcome. Oh, how in the heck are you? Doing great today. Erica, you have your own YouTube uh, channel, The Classy Climb. Mm -hmm. But i got to ask you, you own a trucking company. What the heck made (laughs) you get into trucking? Well, I live in Texas, Austin, Texas. We're in the center of Texas. And all day and night, I see just trucks going boom. By me, uh, you know, I thirty five is like one of the biggest, most popular roads going from Mexico to Canada. And um, I had some friends who were in Florida, and they were like, "Oh yeah, we we own two trucks uh, passively." And I was like, hmm, "Passively, right?" And then we also, I also was in my dentist office, and I was saying, "Oh man, I gotta call my driver back." He's like, "Your driver?" I said, "Yeah, I have a semi truck." And he's like, I've got a semi truck in the oil fields. This is before the, the crash. And so for this moment, my dentist is looking at me. He's got this huge practice in Austin, Texas. And he's just like, you have a truck? And, you know, so just the uniqueness of this industry that's very entrenched in our everyday life, right? If the truck stop, we've got a problem. And uh, we, we learned that with pop tall tissue and, and the issue with that. And, the, and a lot of times we just see it when it comes to hurricanes or because I'm from the Carolinas originally, if trucks can't get into you, they can't really rebuild the city or restart the city. Absolutely. But trucking, though, isn't your first passion, is it? Mm-mm. No, no. Well, tell us about your first passion. So my biggest thing was uh, YouTube. And uh, I'm, I consider myself a storyteller. So I would talk about my family and talk about my travels. And people would be like, What? You know, because I'm a military kid and we lived in Alaska as kids. My brother lived in Germany. Uh, my father was born in Japan on a military base. And so I would just have these interesting stories to tell people. And they would go, no way. No way your family owns that. No way if your family has this business. Uh, and so I started just documenting dirty and kind of doing motivational talking on YouTube. And I would interview people and document my journey in Texas. So I had started a painting and fencing company with my friend. And it was great. It was okay. It was just a, a good, easy business. And I was like, you know, I really love the YouTube more. So I sold my stake in that. And I just ended up doing about 6,000 paid phone consultations. And a lot of times what happens is people have an ideal. They want to start a business or they want to do something different, but they have no one to tell it to. So if they tell their family and friends, their family and friends are kind of like, nah, I don't know about that. Sorry, I, I was just having some... You're YouTube fine. <laughs> issues as I was hitting the wrong buttons. So it's okay. Y- you've done these. You you had a consulting business, or perhaps I guess you still do. Still going, it, yeah. Because mm-hmm. you you mentioned that you have right now four thousand uh, students at the moment. What is it you're coaching them in? Usually, a lot, a lot of times it's starting the business kind of getting connected to marketing techniques and also just like is this the right business for them a lot of people don't do the self-assessment is this the right business for me um because sometimes we start a business because we think it's popular or it's niche and a lot of times it doesn't fit with our schedule it doesn't fit with our lifestyle it doesn't fit with our alignment for our goals right it's like people want to start a really uh time intensive business but they always want to be home and on the computer yeah uh, and uh, that just doesn't work so now, you know that we're talking about trucking, and mm-hmm. I, I'm a trucking safety specialist. Have mm-hmm. you consulted anyone yet that wanted to start a trucking business? We've had lots of phone calls in the past three years about trucking. And my biggest thing I tell people is about cameras and, uh, and clearly safety, but cameras, uh, your guys being safe on the road, drug testing, and like having a safety manual. Because at the time, they were like, well, what's a safety manual? And so at the time, I had a really great insurance company out of Georgia who provided us a thing called Mountain Valley Safety. And so they worked us through a lot of kind of techniques and and a really cool template workbook. But what happens is people don't take it serious. But if you actually do take it serious, your insurance company is much more favorable to you the next year when you want to renew. 
And that is a huge thing. I, I was watching some of your videos, and one of the topics that you addressed is the cost of trucking insurance. Mm -hmm. Of your um, major costs, do you have any idea which number that is, uh, the trucking oh, insurance? Man. So imagine putting 11 trucks on an authority, a first-time authority. Definitely had to put about $26,000 down. Uh, to get all those trucks just started under that one authority. Um, and so a lot of times I meet people who are like, oh, I've got like five grand. And I go, let's say you go with Progressive and they charge you 20 grand for the year. They're going to want 25% down. That's going to take that whole five grand. You don't have any reserves left over. And, you know, some of my Canadian listeners are going, is that all you're paying for insurance? <laughs> <laughs> because I know... Um, one of the topics that you addressed in one of your videos was the um, the proposed law that is taking trucking insurance up to two million. Yeah. Well, most Canadian trucking companies already have two million or more because, of course, we've got to have seven hundred and fifty thousand U.S. Mm -hmm. and a million dollars sometimes isn't enough to cover the seven fifty U.S. Right. because of the exchange rates. So, exchange. Um, most. Canadian companies across border already have two million, and our trucking insurance rates, my God, fifteen thousand dollars a year per truck is really good at the moment. <laughs> That's crazy, but you know, I think it's might because you guys have that weather too. Uh, you know, probably some more safety is is needed. Uh, I would say, to me, in my opinion, if you burn a truck out of Detroit or Chicago, just the snow and the ice. Well, statistically, if you can believe it, fewer crashes happen in the winter. Oh. Because drivers are paying attention in attention. the bad weather. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that makes sense. That makes sense. But, uh, you know, good weather, we have uh, more crashes. I'll, I'll tell you, the crashes in winter are more spectacular, especially if it's in a bad weather crash, because you'll see one truck after another, after another, after another, just getting involved mm -hmm. in the same horrific wreck. It's like a snow sliding and it's like the snowstorm. I'll just see a sliding, sliding, boom, 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 boom. Yeah, and I'm like, that's terrible. It is. And it is terrible. Anyway, we, we're talking about coaching. We're talking about trucking. We're talking mm -hmm. about safety. How would you, for an American company to start up, how would you coach um, a fella or a lady who wants to start their own trucking company? So I, 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 a lot of people have this idea they can do it passively if they sign up under a 3PL and they hire a driver okay, and sorry. the 3PL handles everything. Well, go back. What's a 3PL? A 3PL is a third party logistics company. Right. So uh, let's say I'm Erica Williams and I bought this truck, but Landstar is down the street from me in Dallas and I want to go up under them or Dart, you know, pick a company. And they usually are hiring owner operators. So technically I'm owner operator, but I put a driver in there that's qualified to drive. So sometimes you have to kind of, when it comes to using it that way, which we call passively, you have to do them all at the same time. You have to get the 3PL to sign on, bring them a driver that they can drug test and check to see if their insurance will accept them. And it's like sign paperwork all at the same time. That's one way. And people think it's more passive because they kind of, it takes them out of the equation. The driver has a relationship with 3PL that, that pays their, um, usually pays their salary every week and takes out all the deductions, whether it's your trailer, it's some insurance, they take deductions out and you get a check on Friday. That's one way. If someone said, hey, Erica, no, I want to have the authority, I want to have the whole shebang, I want to be fully like a company, well, then we would be talking them through getting approved, right? And on top of that, where are they going to park the truck? Uh, because that's important to your insurance, especially in Texas, or well, all over the United States. Because when you go apply for your insurance, it's going to ask, where is it sitting when it's not on the road? Right? And, you know, what are the states you're going through? So a lot of times people apply for the wrong process. And so then all of a sudden they need permits to go across the state line from Texas to Arizona. Uh, special permits for oversize. You know, these things are important because you have to determine what kind of freight are you going to be carrying? What type of driver do you have? Yeah, and well, I mean, in my world, drivers are the biggest um, obstacle, I think, 
might be the right word. Is it the same right now in the States? Are good drivers easy to find? Oh, you know, I would say good drivers are plentiful for the right price, right? Because a lot of times people think, oh, well, I'm offering a good price. But a lot of people here in the United States have got accustomed to sign on bonuses. Uh, so what do I mean sign on bonuses? Sign on bonuses, you know, hey, for the first 9,000 miles, we're going to offer you a thousand bucks uh, safe driving, right? Uh, also, we're going to have a lot of times people have, uh, let's say you could to continue to incentivize them every six months, you give them another bonus. So it's a lot of that going on in the industry right now. Uh, I don't know if you saw the news down here in Texas. There was a company got a government contract and they offered $10,000 to sign on bonus because they needed to be able to have drivers ASAP to keep the government contract. Wow. Um, and I'm sure they got a lot of applications when you're... Oh, up. for sure. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, in Canada, we don't, we're don't. we not as big right now on mm -hmm. the, the sign-on bonuses. I do see some for owner-operators, but not so much for uh, industry drivers. But uh, I do... It's a really hot market down here. It's a... I'll tell you, it's a very competitive market trying to hire good drivers everywhere in North America right now. Right. Um, it just, it's, yeah, competitive is the right word without using. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I literally put myself on a wait list for a year for foreign drivers. And I was like, well, what number am I on the wait list in this one particular company? He's like, you're number 847. And, <laughs> sorry, that's for foreign drivers. Yeah, so there's a company, and essentially they walk you through the process of applicants, and the applicants are getting qualified overseas. Uh, they basically, you know, check that they can drive. They actually do a driving test at the certification place, so they can check their documents and make sure they're not just making it up. But there were already 846 people ahead of me on the wait list because it was the kind of between the Trump and Biden right before. It, so they were like, "Hey, we're backed up with getting um, getting people approved, getting their green cards approved, and all that good stuff." The visas, work visas. And where are these people coming from? Europe, South America? All over. Europe, Philippines, um, South America, um, the islands. So, you know, they but they have to go through the process of getting a, a work visa like anybody else. And so at the time, because they were so backed up, they were focusing on getting work visas from Europeans and Philippines because it was a little bit easier right. than getting work visas from Mexico, uh, El Salvador, and some of the southern South American companies. And just changing subjects a little bit, is your, sorry, what's the name of your trucking company? Oh, it's Grandview Freight. There we go. <laughs> We're running under a really great company right now called Last Chance Transportation out of Liberty yeah. Hill. Really great guys, really great family, and we're running out of uh, one of them. Because I wanted you to say whether you are if somebody was to hear this interview that's a truck driver and, uh, For sure. you know, is Erica accepting applications at the moment? <laughs> For drivers, yeah. I think we have three trucks left over a 2015 Freightliner, like a 2012 Volvo, and a, like a 2013 Freightliner that need drivers at the current time. So, and your contact info is in the uh, show notes down below. So, <laughs> people can reach out to you that way if that, if what you say today catches it. Changes it, yeah, for sure. <laughs> you know, you're from, uh, you mentioned you're from the Carolinas already, but you live mm -hmm. over in Texas. Um, mm -hmm. I would suggest that you'd be an American to uh, to apply for the job. Or for sure. I've had plenty of Canadians call, call up when I did the Indeed ads uh, from Toronto. It was very interesting. Well, I live just outside of Toronto, but the, the problem with that is it's called cabotage. Um, because Canadians are legal to drive trucks in the States, but we're not legal to move freight from uh, one point in the States to another point in the States. Because that's, Interesting. Apparently, we're taking jobs away from Americans if we do that. <laughs> and by the way, the same law applies yeah. here in Canada. You, you know, an American can't come up here and move uh, freight from uh, within Canada, but we can move it north and south of the border. So, we can, as long as we're crossing border, we're perfectly legal, and Americans are welcome to come up here, bring you freight in too. Um, but it's just when you take the actual work away, that's, they call it cabotage. And this is one rule I hope to see changed one day, because you, can you imagine 
if you do have a foreigner like myself driving for you, and most of my freight goes north and south, but you have some mm -hmm. good paying freight that you could keep me busy on going from Florida to yeah. Texas for a little bit, and you have to, have to pass it up? Or we have a ton that goes from Louisiana to Texas because the uh, ports. Right. Ton of it. They just not night and day. Pretty much a, a very popular route is from Houston to Atlanta um, and then anywhere in Texas to Louisiana, Shreveport and other, and then the closer to New Orleans port. And so if I was to hire on with you, just giving it a shout out again, mm -hmm. um, that would probably be the type of freight that I would be doing for you? For sure, we do a lot of dry van stuff. Um, we had we had two flatbeds, but we got down to one. Uh, so most of the stuff is just drop and hook. Keep it easy for the guys. And, and you're putting a smile on my face when you say drop and hook as a truck driver. Um, <laughs> Y'all don't like unloading. <laughs> Nobody does. <laughs> when you started your company, what challenges uh, have you had to endure? Well, surprisingly enough, I would call places like our, we'd have a repair or something would happen and I'd call and they go, oh yeah, can I speak to your husband? Can I speak to Mr. Eric Williams? And I'm like, no, no, it's Eric Williams. It's, it's me. You're speaking to me. I'm paying. And they'd be like, huh? <laughs> uh, or we would have, um, honestly, we'd have some guys come in to get hired and they'd be working with my staff that were all men. And then they'd realize it was a woman owner and they would not want to work. Okay, that yeah. one surprises me. But very, they they just one guy said he had a bad experience with a lady boss before, and another guy said um, something about not wanting to work uh, with chatty women or something like that. Like just like these crazy reasons, and so we'd go, okay, well, good luck, dude. Yeah, and does is it still part of the federal government um, mandate in the states? to try to look for ethnic owned trucking companies? Uh, not necessarily, but if you're talking about government contracts, yes. They try to reserve 10%. Uh, okay. Biden just passed the law, so I think it's gonna be like, they're trying to try to reserve 15%, right? And so uh, if you're, prime example, Texas. We have $1.9 billion in transportation government contracts. So let's say 10% of that, you know, is, I don't know, maybe $190 million. But I, from what I can see, they like working with smaller companies in general, not just minority, but smaller. So a lot of small six trucks and under companies get in the door for government contracts. Well, I'm going to, in one of your videos, you had mentioned how many, what's the average size of a trucking company? 90% of all, they, they sorry, matter. They apply to Canada too, the numbers that you uh, mentioned. That's why I'm bringing, it's, it's cross-border. Sorry, go ahead. You're fine. 90% uh, of all trucking companies are six trucks or less. 97.1% of all trucking companies are 20 trucks or less. Yeah. Uh, there's only a really big, I think, 28 companies that have these huge numbers of inventory as far as trucks. Yeah, it's, just, it's crazy how trucking is still a... Without... This sounds insulting, and I don't mean it to be insulting. It's still a mom-pop industry. Mm -hmm. It's a husband, it's a wife, it's a yep. wife, it's a woman, it's a man who own trucking companies. And if you hit 20 or 25 trucks, you're getting big, according to You're the a big guy coming, yeah. Yeah, it's just... It's well, I always look at it like this. I tell you, like, you can have six trucks and have very good living and have maybe one or two people on staff, and it's manageable. Right, a uh, husband and wife can handle six trucks dispatching them from their home. Absolutely. Right. Uh, so, so that's kind of where people get excited about trucking. They want to get into trucking. Um, Fifteen percent of the trucking industry is like non. Um, what we'd call, I think they call it a basically a non-driver owner. Right. Like I, I've never drove a day in my life. Our company just owns trucks, puts it on the road under three PLs, and that's about fifteen percent of the industry. Well, and I, I watched, you are looking for your authorities, are you not? Yes, usually it, you make more money. You make more money, you have more control. Um, if I have a driver who's complaining, hey, I'm not getting a lot of miles, and I'm under a 3PL, I can't, I don't really have a lot of say for him, and I can't force them to book him more. 
it's their authority. It's their choice. Um, they have rules that they're following or they have a reason why they're doing it. Uh, when you have your own authority, I, from what I've seen and what I've liked is Uber Freight, all these little things, you can kind of fill that driver's time up. Right. And you have a little bit more control. However, oh, for sure, for sure. I think you have a lot more risk mm -hmm. as well. So, and the expense of getting your own, um, well, when you're working for 3PL, are you, uh, I know you pay for insurance, but are you sourcing the insurance yourself or? You only cover bobtail insurance and physical damage right. if your truck has a loan on it. Uh, because, and they let you have physical damage, period, whether you have a loan or not, because something happens to your truck, just that extra coverage. So bobtail insurance is not expensive at all. It's depending on the, depending on your credit and that your history. Some people I know pay a thousand dollars for the whole year. Yeah. For and bobtail insurance. For Canadians that are listening, bobtail insurance is not something that we have up here. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an insurance goes on the plate, and as long as the plate's on the truck, you're covered. So. Uh, yeah. But just or if he's driving, not working, right? He's going yes. to go get some lunch. He bumped into someone's car. He wasn't working. He was going to lunch. You know, it's that weird coverall. Yeah. How does that's an interesting question. Sorry, and this, you may not know the answer. Mm -hmm. This just popped into my head. Personal conveyance. When you are operating on, under personal conveyance, you're not under dispatch. Um, who's insurance? That's where Bobtail on? covers. Okay. Mine. So if I have Bobtail and I'm under the three fields authority, wherever, if he drives from, if he did, let's say he detaches the trailer. And he's like, I'm going to go over here to this drive through at Wendy's. And he hits the sign at Wendy's. <laughs> you know, he's just too tall. And he hits the, hits the clearance. I, our company, our insurance would have to cover that because he's not working. He's not on the clock. Um, he shouldn't be logged in for hours. He should be um, on, on lunch or break. Yeah. Uh, and so that we cover that. Yeah, no, I just, personal conveyance is such uh, an interesting quagmire only because you may have a trailer still because you may mm -hmm. be sleeping in the middle of your 10 hour break and all of a sudden somebody for whatever reason says you got to move yeah um so now you're moving you're not under dispatch kind of technically it doesn't count as driving time but you could have a trailer and freight yep you could like oh anyway it I gets know. it gets wiggle room it gets a, it gets wiggle room on there but that's also why they want you to have physical damage just in case yeah, uh, it's a lot of this. Like, cover your butt, CYA. It is crazy at the moment, um, and as you'd mentioned in your video, trucking insurance is crazy. I know the premiums down there are crazy. And, um, well, I, I say they're crazy. They sound cheap to Canadians, but for everybody, for sure. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Trucking insurance is flipping expensive. Um, yeah. What? And then if it doubles in February, wow. Well, so, because I, I think a lot of people think, hey, man, I've got just enough money to get the insurance. Slide through the door. Well, if it doubles to $2 million, which you guys are used to, but we're not, the guy, average guy or girl, instead of having that five grand to put down, are going to put ten grand down. Yeah. And that might be it harder. Because I meet a lot of drivers who, they saved up enough money to buy their own truck. <clears throat> but they didn't save up enough money to buy a trailer. So I know they're short on insurance to, to cover their own insurance, if that's the case. Yeah, there's so many things. And you were talking in one of the videos about expenses. Um, I got to ask, is your truck, the Freightliner that's down at the moment waiting for a part? It had been waiting for a part for months. Is it back on the road yet? I literally called up to a Western Star near the border of Canada. And he said, I will order you the part. It'll take me seven days to get it. And then I'm going to ship it to you. So I'm waiting on that part to get here, or well, to get to our office in Texas while I'm here in North Carolina. And we're going to drive it over to the Houston Freightliner. Because they're like, oh, just send it to us. I'm like, no, we want to personally hand walk that thing in because you guys said you, you were calling around. Well, they're like, yeah, we called around regionally. We didn't call the way to almost to Canada. We called around Texas. We called around Louisiana. So, well, and so hopefully awesome. in a week it should be good. Who in the hell cares where the part comes from as long as you get the part and back in? <clears throat> they made this big thing about it being covered. Uh, like, let's say I, I didn't get it from a Freightliner or just maybe a mom and pop shop. They weren't going to recover the, they weren't going to warranty it. 
under Freightliners, what they were their complaint was. That I could get that part from somewhere and they didn't know where it was from and so they can't warranty the work and I'm like, That's crazy. Like if I bought the part brand new, it's a brand new part. Yeah. Yeah, we won't get into counterfeit parts at the moment. That's another whole yeah. <laughs> um, story. Um, what, if any, are your expansion plans right now for your company? Well, really, my biggest plan is to get way more trailers because I had tried to get government contracts in Texas. And what ended up happening is they would go, yeah, we need you to have about six trailers that you drop off here at this location and one truck. Well, I'd go, well, where, where am I going to park all these trailers when I don't have the government contract? So, <laughs> so it was interesting to learn, like, sometimes a lot of the government contracts, you pick a trailer up take one over here and you still had to leave one so it's like you you still had to have more trailers than you had trucks so i was learning a lot there but that's my my number one thing is like um some one or one one driving one um one box truck but mostly just trailers because they're because okay. even if i don't have the contract anymore i can rent those out yeah and i mean it's not uncommon to have two trailers for every tractor because you've got mm -hmm. to as you were saying drop them let them be loaded while you aren't there, mm -hmm. which is another whole nightmare, another insurance problem, uh, theft, other people using your trailers. Just Yeah, having to put locks on them. I mean, I've known a lot of guys lately to have to drop their own trailer, go pick up Amazon trailer, take the Amazon trailer where it is, and they had to leave their trailer in the certain part of the parking lot of the Amazon for, them, for it to be like under the security camera, and then come back to their trailer. So now you got locks, you got security locks you're having to put on your stuff. You got to, you know, it, it, that to me is the logistic nightmare. But it's a, it's a big thing right now. It, well, Amazon is a damn big thing right now. <laughs> Very well, big. Because of what we've just gone through, I'm sure Amazon's business has, uh, in the last 18 months, exploded exponentially. Because, at least up here in Canada, everybody's shopping online. Um, if you ever get a chance to see Texas or go through I-35, there is a place in Dallas where there's like 500 little blue Amazon Sprinter vans, right? And then even by where our office is, there's like 400, you know, Sprinter vans, right? And then there's like another 200 Amazon trucks with trailers. And so you see this stuff and you're like, man, they are booming. Um, so it, we also have a lot of Alibaba warehouses down here in Texas too, so... That's that's another story for another day. But yeah, they're they're doing a lot. They're doing a lot of movement. See, and Alibaba is not something that I hear much about in Canada. I mean, I know it's um, a, a major competitor to Amazon, but I really don't know anybody here that shops Alibaba. Well, a lot of times what you have is people who are doing private label stuff. Warehouses are doing uh, cheap parts from from China. They're putting a lot of those items in warehouses in Texas, so you get your items faster, right? So um, I think Jack Mao, unfortunately, who probably was going to relocate to Texas, but can't leave China right now, <laughs> probably will leave China forever at this point. Um, it, I think they are making a big in, in expansion plans into Texas, into the southeast with warehouses, empty warehouses. So I, I know we're, we're running up against time here. Erica, if somebody wanted to reach out to you to get some consulting done on how to start their own uh, passive trucking company, Where? what's the best way to reach out to you? Man, the best way is uh, our staff would be at admin at classyclimbers.com. Um, our staff can get you forwarded over to the calendar link and you can look at what time works best for you. Um, that's probably your best bet is the admin at classyclimbers.com. It's the, one of the fastest. One of our executive assistants was over that email. Okay. And describe for us what Classy Climbers does. Well, Classy Climb was, uh, I was working, I had closed one business in North Carolina. I moved to Texas. And so I'm working in the daytime as an apartment manager. And I'm working at night delivering pizzas. And I would hair switch clothes and dress really nice and go out. And people were like, look at that girl. She's always climbing. And then my friend was like, Classy Climbing. And I started laughing as a joke, but then I actually took it on and used it. Um, and so it's really just the the climb of life, right? We're climbing, we're growing, uh, and we can do it classy, you know, that's all. But the Classy Climbers has schools that talk about, some classes that talk about running businesses online, um, running YouTube business online, right? Because I, 
I look at YouTube as a business. I treat it as a business. It's treated me very well over the past six years. Uh, and then I have other smaller classes, just documenting like how I run, um, like purchasing tax liens uh, and different, different things like that. Did I gotta ask one of the videos you were talking about um, uh, property that you were hoping to acquire? Did that deal go through? Oh my gosh! You know, here's the crazy part. I found a smaller property around the corner that we will use for truck parking. That property, the owners went from wanting like 2.5 million to wanting 3.5 million, and they could get it because it's a hot market right now. So if they don't sell to the other person, if that deal doesn't completely go through. Uh, in about 90, 90 days, I'll, it'll revert back to me because I was the second lowest bid. So. Yeah. Well, good luck on that one because it sounded like <laughs> no, an awesome, crazy. Well, it sounded like an awesome spot that uh, you got the building in the front. You had lots of truck parking. You said three to four hundred spots. Three hundred forty-four spots. That's it'd have been it have been fun. So we're hope. I'm not going to joke to you. Like a lot of Dallas and California people come in, they'll bid on a project, and then it, it falls through. So that's kind of what I'm hoping on. Well, I'm hoping for you. How's that? Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Erica of Classy Climbers and Grandview Freight, thanks so much for coming on the show. Last word. Uh, you guys, hey, listen, anything's possible. Don't get discouraged. Trucking's a billion-dollar industry, multi-billion-dollar industry. Uh, there's probably somewhere in there you can get in. And I'll tell you, trucking has been very, very good to me and my family. Um, it's an awesome industry. So anybody that's looking for help, if you're an American, reach out to my friend Erica. And she might be able to give you a hand, at least give you some tips. All right? For and sure, Erica's for sure. contact info is in the show notes down below. Thanks so much, Erica. I hope you loved the show as much as I did. Please leave us a like, a thumbs up. A review, a comment, a rating, if it is in your heart. Thank you so much. And I do really appreciate your time. And join us again next week for another exciting interview.